You can't fix health care until you fix health. There is no pill for this. And I keep saying that and people don't believe me, but just take a look. Statins, they'll fix your LDL. LDL is not the problem. LDL is a symptom of the problem. Food Addiction is a podcast which explores the disease of food addiction and presents the solution. We interview professionals and counselors who specialize in the disease of food addiction, and we interview individuals who have successfully recovered from food addiction and discuss how they did it. Esther Helga goodmans Dotier was motivated to change careers after she recovered from food addiction by opening a food addiction treatment center and the INFACT School, the world's first and only sugar and food addiction counseling training, which offers a recognized certification. Check out the website for more information on obtaining this certification, as well as proven recovery programs at infactschool.com. Listen to these episodes as we discuss the problem and the solution around food addiction. Today, I'm excited to host Dr. Robert Lustig on the podcast. Thank you and welcome, Dr. Lustig. First of all, my pleasure. Second of all, it's Rob. Okay, Rob, here we go. I'm so excited to host you. Esther Helga Goodman's Dotier of the Infect School, and this is her podcast, introduced us, and I know you teach at the Infect School, and she has a lot of respect for you. She introduced us, and uh, so we're going to get into some questions and talk about your book, Metabolical. How's that? My pleasure. You bet. Okay, I'm going to introduce you, and then we'll start with some questions. Dr. Robert Lustig is Professor Emeritus of Pediatrics, Division of Endocrinology at the University of California, San Francisco. He specializes in the field of neuroendocrinology with an emphasis on the regulation of energy balance by the central nervous system. His research and clinical practice has focused on childhood obesity and diabetes. Dr. Lustig holds a bachelor's in science degree from MIT, a doctorate in medicine from Cornell, Medical College and a Master's of Studies in Law from UC Hastings College of Law. Dr. Lustig has fostered a global discussion of metabolic health and nutrition, exposing some of the leading myths that underlie the current pandemic of diet-related disease. He believes the food business, by pushing processed food loaded with sugar, has hacked our bodies and minds to pursue pleasure instead of happiness fostering today's epidemics of addiction and depression. By focusing on real food, we can beat the odds against sugar, processed food, uh, obesity, and disease. And you wrote a couple of books. One is Fat Chance, uh, from, and it's a New York Times uh, on the bestsellers list. And the latest one, uh, Metabolical, I have read and uh, have formed my questions and I have a lot of quotes for you and you know, ask you to address them. Um, actually, it's not really a, you might, you might also mention the third book. And the reason is because we're talking about addiction and I wrote a book that's pretty much all about addiction and depression. And that is the hacking of the American mind, which really is about Mm. diet and mental health. And so this is a book that your audience may very much, uh, uh, appreciate. Good. Wonderful. And I would love to have you back and maybe talk about that one and Fat Chance. Um, So, yeah, we'd love to have you back. I know Esther would agree. Um, You explain that the book Metabolic, uh, it's not really a word metabolical, but but it's a combination of metabolic and diabolical and what is going on is metabolical. Uh, Your YouTube video, Sugar, the Bitter Truth, has gone viral with over 24 million views. And this is the truth. This is These are the studies that back it up. I'm a believer. Uh, we're going to talk about big food, big pharma, medical industry, and the government, which are all contributing to this. And I told Esther when we decided who to invite, I said, I want to invite Rob. I've followed you. I've listened to your, your uh, videos. You're brilliant. And you're bold. You speak the truth, uh, which is based on science and data. Yeah, let's start by talking about your work and why you you decided to write this book. First of all, you know, I didn't come at this with an agenda. Uh, I'm a pediatric neuroendocrinologist. I started out taking care of kids with brain tumors. And it turns out that a lot of kids with brain tumors become massively obese, and I had to deal with the obesity. As I researched that phenomenon, which is called hypothalamic obesity, I realized 
that the same physiology that was causing these patients' obesity was actually important in general obesity, not related to brain tumors. The hormone insulin, okay, is, you know, the diabetes hormone. Everybody knows that, you know, you have to take insulin if you have diabetes to lower your blood sugar. Well, where does the blood sugar go with, because of the insulin? The answer is it goes to your fat. Insulin is the energy storage hormone. And we started realizing that pretty much everybody with obesity had an insulin problem. And actually, the, those with the highest insulin problems also had all of these other diseases, like, for instance, um, uh, polycystic ovarian disease, fatty liver disease, cancer, dementia, gout, um, hypertension. And it turned out we realized that insulin was the bad guy in the story. And so then the question was, what makes insulin go up in people that don't have brain tumors? And the answer was sugar. And so, mm -hmm. right. uh, you know, that's how I got into this. And, you know, basically I've been trying to explain, you know, the vicissitudes of the American diet, you know, to the public ever since and explaining that, you know, there is no pill for this. You know, the only right. way to get insulin down is get rid of the refined carbohydrate and sugar. Many misconceptions, uh, you outline them in the book. We are in a health crisis. We are not unhealthy or those of us who are obese because of lack of exercise, lack of willpower, <clears throat> or that we've not found the next right diet. I'm going to throw a quote out here from your book. Sugar is not dangerous because it's of its calories or because it makes you fat. Sugar is dangerous because it's sugar. It is not nutrition. You say it is not a food. It is added. And when consumed in excess, it's a, it's a toxin uh, and it's addictive. So talk about sugar and our food. So people think that sugar is empty calories. It's true that it doesn't confer anything else, but calories are important. Well, can you name an energy source that is calories, but is not food, that is not nutrition, that is actually toxic when consumed in high dose and it's addictive and we love it anyway mm -hmm. answer yeah alcohol yeah ethanol right okay. we talk about it being metabolized the same way well in fact sure, yes fructose the sweet molecule and sugar and alcohol are metabolized in your mitochondria the little energy burning factories inside all of your cells exactly the same way. And so it shouldn't be surprising that children get the diseases of alcohol, type 2 diabetes and fatty liver disease, without consuming alcohol because they consume, you know, the, the, uh, the analog, if you will. Okay. The big difference yeah. between alcohol and fructose is that for alcohol, the yeast does the first step of metabolism, which is called glycolysis. For sugar, we do our own first step. But after that, they're exactly the same. You are overloading and basically causing inhibition of your mitochondria. All of these diseases that I just mentioned are mitochondrial diseases. And anything that inhibits mitochondrial functioning will cause them. It just so happens that sugar is the biggest and the most prevalent and the cheapest and the mo best tasting of all of the things that cause mitochondrial dysfunction. And it's the one we yes. give to children and call love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you say food drives both illness and wellness is the poison and the antidote. So what's happened to our food? What, what's uh, taken it from my great grandparents had a farm, they had chickens, garden, uh, they ate real food. Yep. And so in the last, what, 120 years uh, throughout history, we've mm -hmm. changed it, messed with it. It's not food anymore. Exactly. So the question is, what's the definition of food? Answer, go to the dictionary. And here's the answer. Substrate that contributes either to growth or burning of an organism. That's a yeah. great definition. It's a fine definition. Yeah. I am 110% behind that definition. Okay. Growth or burning. Exactly right. Okay. So let's take burning first. Turns out fructose actually inhibits burning. 
Now, people say fructose is four calories per gram. Yeah, that's if you blow it up in a bomb calorimeter. If you add it to a mitochondrion, it actually inhibits burning. And that's how we burn. So you actually reduce the amount of burning because you in, uh, inhibit mitochondrial function. And fructose does it three ways. It inhibits three separate enzymes involved in how mitochondria burn energy. I won't bore your audience with the details right now. That's a little too much science, a little too much inside baseball. But, you know, we have the data. And it's the same thing that happens to alcohol. It's, in fact, it's the same reason that aspirin causes rise syndrome. And we don't give aspirin to children anymore because, you know, we don't want them to basically die of fatty right. liver disease. So the bottom line is sugar, it, it actually inhibits burning. Okay, now yes. let's take growth. My colleague at Hebrew University, Jerusalem, Dr. Efrat Monsenigo Ornan, has shown in several papers now that ultra-processed food, and in particular sugar, actually inhibit growth. It inhibits skeletal growth, it inhibits trabecular, cortical bone growth, it inhibits long bone growth, and it actually hijacks growth because it actually feeds cancer cells. So mm -hmm. if a energy substrate does not contribute to growth and does not contribute to burning, is it a food? Well, alcohol is an energy substrate, seven calories per gram. It does not contribute to growth and it does not contribute to burning. Is it a food? No. Right. Trans fats yeah. are nine calories per gram. They inhibit mitochondrial function. They inhibit growth. Are they a food? No. So just because something's an energy source doesn't make it a food. Right. Sugar yeah. is not a food. It is a food yes. additive. When you think of it that way, then it turns the whole table on exactly what it is we're eating because ultra processed food is high sugar food. And the reason is because the sugar has been put in for palatability. It's been put in to yeah. make you eat it. Because if you taste mm -hmm. it, that ultra processed food without the sugar that's been added to it, and sugar is added to 74% of the items in the American grocery store on purpose, you know, for the food industry's yeah. purposes, not for yours, you yeah. would never eat that. It would taste like garbage. So yeah. bottom line, sugar is not food. No, it's not food. And I remember in your book, you talked about our, in the 80s, 70s, 80s, let's take fat out. Fat is making us fat. Truth is fat doesn't really make us fat. And that's right. So to make it more palatable, they started throwing in sugar and the cheap, uh, high fructose corn syrup. So exactly right. um, that seems to be when a lot of things started. Uh, a couple of things I'd like you to define. You say you are not what you eat. You are what you metabolize. Define metabolic syndrome for right. those that may not understand it. Well, before I can define metabolic syndrome, maybe I need to define metabolic health. All right. Health. Okay. So there are three words that get bandied about and get confused with each other. And I want to make it clear what these three terms mean okay. to your audience. The first term is food science. Okay. That is what happens to food between the ground and the mouth. The second term is nutrition. That is what happens to food between the mouth and the cell. And the third term is metabolic health. And that's what happens to food inside the cell. Now, it turns out all the diseases that we've been talking about, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, you know, dyslipidemia, cardiovascular disease, that, that all, you know, and down the line, these are all things that happen inside the cell because mm -hmm. of metabolic dysfunction. So when your cells don't work right, that's metabolic syndrome. And primarily it's when your mitochondria do not work right. Now, different organs can manifest different symptoms. And so fatty liver disease doesn't look like heart disease, but in fact, they are due to the same problem. Mitochondrial dysfunction inside each of these different organs. Polycystic ovarian syndrome does not look like gout, but in fact, they cluster together and it's because of mitochondrial dysfunction inside other different organs. So the thing that 
basically ties all of these things together is what's going on inside the cell and specifically what's going on inside the mitochondria. And the goal is to get your mitochondria to work at peak performance. So why would you give it a toxin? Right. That's where we are. Okay. We yep. are at toxicology 101. Do not poison your cells. All right? right. And it's not about nutrition. It's not about counting up, you know, numbers of, you know, vitamins or amino acids. It's about making your cells work right. So metabolic syndrome, getting back to that, is high blood pressure, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. Uh, the, I know you threw kidney disease a couple times in there. What else? Right. Cancer, dementia. Cancer. Fatty yeah. liver disease, polycystic ovarian disease, type 2 diabetes. Right. All of these diseases, these diseases right now are 75% of healthcare costs in America. 75% yeah. due to bad diet due to yes. metabolic dysfunction, due to mitochondria not working right. Many people say that, hey, my parents had high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, um, and, and I'm going to have it, I'm going to get it. And you cite that genetics contribute only 50%. The rest is no. involved in the environment and the choices you make, right? Gen genetics only contribute 15%, one five. 15%. Not 50. Okay. 15 15. Oh, the rest of its environment. So, yes, it is true. People constantly say, well, my mother had high blood pressure. I'm going to get high blood pressure. Yeah, because you eat the same crap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You eat the same crap, right? That's exactly, exactly, right. exactly what it is. So, you know, there, there are a lot of myths about what is going on in terms of the, these diseases. But the bottom line uh -huh. is... All the science that we have generated thus far and all of the drugs that have been uh, uh, you know, discovered and uh, promulgated thus far to deal with any of these eight diseases have not worked. Okay? Is there a mm. cure for type 2 diabetes? No. Is there a cure for dyslipidemia? No. Is there a cure for cancer? No. Is there a cure for dementia? No. And down mm -hmm. the line. And the reason is yeah. because, because none of the drugs that we have developed actually get to the mitochondria where the problem is. Mm -hmm. We can't get there. Yeah. Mitochondria won't let those things in. The only thing that gets in mm -hmm. is food. Now, unfortunately, yeah. food can go either way. It can either help your mitochondria or it can hurt them. And so... Right. It's either the poison idea, or an antidote. That's right. So the idea that food is medicine sounds good, you know, on a bumper sticker. But the fact of the matter is food can be medicine if it helps your mitochondria, but it can also be poison if it hurts it. So the question is, how do you tell the difference? And this is getting back to the question you asked me before. What is real food? How do you determine what is actually healthy? And we've come up with a simple way of answering that question three precepts. We call this the metabolic matrix. And here, nine words, three principles, nine words. Protect the liver, feed the gut, support the brain. Mm. Any food that does all three of those is healthy. Any food that yeah. does none of those three things is poison. Any food that does right. one or two, but not all three, is going to be somewhere in the middle. And that's what the data actually right. show. Right. I know you talked about the Nova scale in one of your um, in one of your talks that uh, one is sort of an apple, and then a four or five is a McDonald's apple pie. Right. So yeah. in, in the scale of yeah, in the but, scale of what's real and what's processed. That's right. So processed food is high sugar, low fiber food. Real food mm -hmm. is low sugar, high fiber food. Real food yeah. makes those bad diseases get better. Processed food makes those diseases get worse. It's just that simple. Yeah. And the reason is because sugar is a mitochondrial toxin. And the fiber in the food is actually food for your bacteria. It's food for your microbiome. And when your microbiome is not fed, your microbiome feeds on you. It actually causes the... Um, uh, uh, dissolution of the mucin layer that lines your intestine that acts as a barrier 
to keep the junk in your intestine, which is like a sewer, from getting into your bloodstream mm -hmm. and causing inflammation. And so, so okay. improving metabolism and suppressing inflammation is what health is all about. And a yep. low sugar, high fiber diet will do it. And a high sugar, low fiber diet will cause it. Just that simple. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you mention NCDs a lot in your book. Talk about what an NCD is. Define that. So NCD, non-communicable disease. So it's basically a disease that's not infectious. Most NCDs are exposures, and they can be exposures to things like air pollution or bad water, exposures to food, all right? And a lot of them are due to food. So again, you know, there are things in food that are problems. We've actually developed a recommendation engine that you can use in the grocery store to figure out whether or not any of the things in your food will kill you, all right? It's called oh, Perfect, P-E-R-F-A-C-T. Nice. -E you can go okay. online at perfect.co and you can download the app and it will it basically help you navigate your grocery store so that you can mm -hmm. actually stay away from all the junk that they won't tell you by putting it on the label. Um, talk about the hormones in our body related to hunger and, and feeling satisfied. Absolutely. So there is a hormone that comes from your stomach, and that hormone is called ghrelin. And ghrelin goes up when your stomach is empty. And ghrelin goes to the brain via the bloodstream, and binds to receptors in the brain, and says, feed me, you know, like O3-2. <laughs> All right? And so you eat. And when you eat, then ghrelin goes down. That should be the end of hunger, right? That should be the end of the meal, right? Mm -hmm. Wrong. So the suppression of ghrelin by eating is the end of hunger. It is not the end of the meal. Anyone can eat past the end of hunger and do routinely almost every yes. single meal in this country. Okay? The yes. idea that somehow... You know, lowering your hunger is going to reduce your food intake is a joke. That's not going to happen because there are many other reasons to eat other than hunger. Reward, stress, okay, anxiety. Yes. Okay, lots of reasons to eat that have nothing to do with hunger. But yes, ghrelin is the hunger hormone and it does suppress. But there's one thing that you can consume that won't suppress ghrelin, sugar. So if you mm. drink a soda, your ghrelin levels don't get suppressed. So you can still eat a, a whole lot more. So you've taken on all those calories, plus you've taken on this fructose, which is a mitochondrial toxin, and you haven't even suppressed your hunger to boot. That's a real problem. So yeah. sodas are about the worst thing you can possibly put in your body. All right, now yeah. food goes through the intestine and finally gets to the end of the intestine. And at the end of the intestine, there's a second hormone. And that hormone has a name. It's called peptide YY3-36, to or PYY. Now, PYY is located at the end of the intestine. The food gets there. The cells there secrete the PYY, goes through the uh, bloodstream, enters the brain, and binds to receptors. And then that signal says, oh, my God, I'm going to die if I eat anything more. I am so satiated. That is the satiety signal. That peptide YY signal is the end of the meal. Now, mm. ghrelin, end of hunger, peptide YY, end of the meal. There's 22 feet of intestine between those two signals takes time. The food yeah. has to move through 22 feet of intestine before you can get that second signal. So wait 20 minutes for second portions. Let the food yeah. do its work. Yeah, you talk about insulin too, like not, not only the fructose uh, playing a role here, but the insulin mm -hmm. uh, keeps, pe the, the rise of insulin keeps people from feeling that 
that uh, I'm done eating, I should be done eating, right? That's right. So insulin, again, is the energy storage hormone. When your brain is insulin sensitive, it's also part of the satiety signal. It basically says, hey, I'm in the middle of metabolizing a meal. I don't need to eat anymore until I've taken care of this, you know, bolus of food first. That's when your brain is insulin sensitive. The problem is that part of metabolic syndrome is having brain insulin resistance so that you don't actually respond to that insulin signal. And so you don't slow down your food intake. And so you're not basically getting that feeling of fullness, that feeling of satiety. And so you continue mm -hmm. to eat. So what we've learned is that the only way to solve this problem is you got to get the insulin down because you have to improve your brain insulin resistance. And because the higher the insulin is, the more resistant your brain gets because ligands downregulate their own receptors. So the more insulin, the fewer receptors, therefore the less chance that any insulin molecule will bind to the receptor, therefore less chance of getting the signal. Okay. You, what mm -hmm. you have to do is you have to get the insulin down. So you need a yes. low insulin diet. Well, mm -hmm. what's a low insulin diet? Well, don't eat the things that make the insulin go up. Well, there are only two things that make insulin go up. Refined carbohydrate and sugar. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to get into some statistics. You've thrown some out. Uh, I've got some other ones for you to address around the health in our country and around food. I mentioned this to you. I'm going to throw myself out here as an example, if you want to use me as an example. I am a recovered alcoholic. I am a recovered food addict. I was addicted to sugar and processed foods. Right. When I stopped drinking, I began using food even more and sugar. And you talked about the same ethanol sugar yeah. response in our bodies. I am in recovery, a uh, 12 step program. I have kept 70 pounds off for almost seven years by eating no sugar, no processed foods, only whole real foods. I had diabetes, I had high blood pressure, I had other obesity related illnesses, metabolic syndrome. They are all now gone because I eat real food, no sugar, and I did it in a recovery program. Right. So use me as an example if you would, if you would like. I, I am living what you're talking about. Well, thank you, so. for, thank you for uh, offering that, Susan. I appreciate that. Yeah, so you're this, welcome. So this is, look, this is for in fact, and I you know, appreciate you know, what you are all trying to do, and I am you know, completely and 100% supportive. In fact, I actually went to an addiction treatment recovery dinner uh, just two nights ago here in the Bay Area uh, yeah. for Sisters of Sobriety. So I'm okay. I'm very, very clear on what the issue is. So yeah. there are a lot of people who are trying to get off alcohol. And yeah. so they go to Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm -hmm. And Alcoholics Anonymous is a good organization. I have nothing against AA. Okay. And the reason why Alcoholics Anonymous works is community. Yes. Okay. Because community is serotonin. Serotonin is the complacency, the um, uh, contentment neurotransmitter. Basically, yeah. it's the opposite of dopamine or the pleasure neurotransmitter. Mm -hmm. And what you don't need when you're an addict is more pleasure. What you need is contentment. Mm -hmm. Be able to right. sit and say, this feels good. I don't want or need any more. And so, right. and so AA provides that, and that is a great thing. However, if you go into the back room after the meeting, okay, you got the rock stars, you got the brownies, you know, you got the Kool-Aid. Bottom line is what has happened is you have traded one addiction for another. You have yes. basically taken an addiction that is socially unacceptable alcohol and turned it into an addiction that is socially acceptable and very prevalent sugar. So yes. in order to really get unaddicted, you have to get rid of all the things that drive that addiction slash reward center. Right. And that includes yeah. chemical addictions, cocaine, amphetamine, nicotine, alcohol, sugar. And it also includes behaviors, shopping, gambling, internet gaming, social mm -hmm. media, pornography. We hear about right. addiction transfer all the time. Oprah, you know, 
talked about this in her own life, you know, routinely. The bottom line is until we recognize addiction as a concept for what it is rather than for the chemical specifically that is driving any individual person's addiction, we will continue to have problems. And I'm trying yeah. to help yeah. people understand that. Yeah, understood. And uh, I got sober. I used food to get sober. Uh, I couldn't have done it at the same time, but I did. I've done, a, I've done them both, and I am clean. Uh, I want to go over some health statistics, kind of keep things uh, moving here, because we have some. We have the big food, big pharma we're going to talk about. But sure. let me throw out a couple of statistics to you uh, uh, that I think are so incredible. Um, you defined metabolic syndrome. Um, 88% of Americans, 88% of Americans are metabolically ill. Change that. It's um, 93% now. It is 93% now. Okay, 93. Okay, let me throw out a couple of more stats uh, for you. By the year 2030, just seven years from now, virtually half of all Americans will be obese. Correct. Not just overweight, but obese. Right. Americans rank, here's your next stat, Americans rank among the worst of the developed countries in the world, number one for diabetes, number two for Alzheimer's, number five for cancer, number six for cardiovascular disease. And then finally, in the U.S., during the last four years, our life expectancy for the first time in many years has dropped. And it's not due to COVID. It was dropping before COVID. Okay. Yeah, it would be because that's more than four years ago. Yeah. yeah. So talk about these stats. We're an unhealthy nation, uh, largely. And um, it's really, you say it, it's it's about sugar and, and, real, and, and real food versus processed foods we're not eating. It's about nutrition. And uh, it's just, it's incredible, this whole thing. So the thing to know is it's not just us. In fact, the whole world's getting sick. It's not just mm -hmm. us. But we happen to be the worst because we have the highest uh, uh, percentage of our uh, foodstuffs coming from ultra-processed food. So we have the highest um, exposure to the toxin, if you will. So it shouldn't be surprising that we have these ridiculously awful statistics. Um, yep. We in America are paying a longevity tax. So if you look at Japan, they have the highest uh, lifespan, 88 years. If you look at America, okay, our mean is like 80 years right now between women and men, and, and it's going down. So there is an eight-year longevity tax that we are paying against the Japanese. But if you are obese, it is a 15-year longevity tax. And if you have metabolic syndrome, it is a 20-year longevity tax. And the question is, what's different here and why is ours going down and other countries, you know, they're, they're not going down, they're going up. And the answer is because our food sucks. Okay, we have the worst yeah. food. Now, we also have the worst stress. Okay, we also have the most, you know, the second most air pollution after China, you know, and believe me, China has a huge problem because China has 14% diabetes and they're not even fat. And a lot of that may be their air pollution because air pollution causes systemic inflammation and systemic inflammation causes diabetes. Remember, I said there were two things. You got to promote mm -hmm. metabolism and suppress inflammation. Well, air pollution causes inflammation, okay? Okay. So, you know, it's not just the food, but yeah, our food is like the worst. So yeah. what are we going to do about it? And the answer is we're trying at many different levels to try to impact the individual, the uh, medical community, you know, the healthcare establishment, public health uh, epidemiologists, uh, and then, of course, trying to influence the food industry and uh, Congress. And I will tell you, it's a tough go. Uh, no, yeah. no question about it. But there is no pill. We think, oh, we've got Ozempic. We've got Wagovi. We've, you know, we can make fat people thin. So, like, why would we have to do anything? This is completely, you know, turned on its head. Yes, it is true Ozempic and Wagovi do lead to some weight loss, 16% weight loss. And that's pretty darn good. And I'm not saying it's not. And I'm not saying that this, these medicines are useless. 
However, when you take a look at what that weight is, it turns out it's equal amounts fat and muscle. Hmm. Now, you don't want to lose muscle. Right. You want to lose fat. You don't want to lose muscle. But you're losing just as much muscle as you are fat. You know what also causes loss of fat and muscle? Starvation. Hmm. Now, when you look at yeah. the symptoms of people on Ozempic and Wagovi, they are nausea, vomiting, bloating, abdominal pain, pancreatitis. Okay. These are what happen when you are starving. Because basically what those medicines are doing is they're basically giving your brain a kickstart saying, you know, I've eaten too much. And that's why you eat less. And that's good. But the bottom line is you don't want to be losing muscle because the older you are, the more muscle you lose, the quicker you die. So yeah. Yeah. we don't have medicines to actually solve the problem. We have medicines to band-aid the problem, to bypass the problem, but not to solve the problem. The only way mm -hmm. to solve the problem is fix the food. Right. Yeah, we're going to start talking about uh, food, big pharma, um, the medical industry, medical field, and, and government. A couple of statistics as we go into this. Ultra-processed foods now account for 70% of the grocery items in a grocery store. As you said, 74% of the foods in a grocery store have sugar added. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., 33% of our, the sugar in our diets comes from sugar-sweetened drinks such as Coca-Cola. And sugar leads to metabolic uh, syndrome and goes to liver fat. And there are 262 different names for added sugar. So the food industry can kind of sneak it in without us noticing. I'm going to go to this perfect.co to see because there are probably some I don't even know about. They're there. If you want, if you want to look, go to the Hypoglycemia Support Foundation or hypoglycemia.org. Okay. And they all 262 are listed. We're actually looking for okay. more. So if people know more, we want to hear from you. Yeah, I, I hear you. Um, they're sneaky, very sneaky. They are. So um, I'm going to start with a quote in your book. You can't fix health care until you fix health. You can't fix health until you fix the diet. You can't fix the diet until you know what the hell is wrong. You talk about the moral ha hazards, the immoral hazards, sub subterfuge, uh, deception, propaganda, and you say the truth will set you free, and we are not getting the truth. So they've got blood on their hands. I'm just well, say. well, they sort of do, and that's one of the reasons why I do what I do, and I'm you know relatively vocal about it. Um, yes, you can't fix health care until you fix health. There is no pill for this, all right? And I keep saying that, and people don't believe me, but just take a look. Statins, they'll fix your LDL. Yeah. LDL is not the problem. LDL is a symptom of the problem. Do you know how what, what the increase in longevity is for taking statins for primary prevention of heart disease? Four days. What? Wow. Four days. Okay. And what are the chances of getting diabetes or rhabdomyolysis? 20%. Is a 20% risk uh, increase worth a four-day increase in lifespan and oh and, and you know add add the cost of those medicines while you're at it i mean it just yeah. doesn't make sense all right so that's yeah. that's one example okay another example high blood glucose diabetes okay so we have insulin we have oral hypoglycemics we can knock that blood glucose down does that improve lifespan in fact five separate studies actually showed that Intensive therapy to get your hemoglobin A1C down and try to prove your diabetes actually makes you die sooner. And the reason is because the insulin is the bad guy. The goal is not just yeah. to lower your blood glucose. The goal is to lower your blood insulin. And yes. so why would giving insulin or drugs that make your insulin go up be good? They're not. All right. These are examples. So. You can't fix health care until you fix health, and we're not fixing health. You can't fix health until you fix diet, and we haven't even begun to try to fix diet. And the reason right. is because the food industry is making money hand over fist. They don't want anything right. to change. Yeah, the numbers you cite, the food industry grosses $1.46 trillion, $657 billion gross margin of 45%. They get rich, we get sick. 
and they keep saying that we're fat. Obese people are at fault for eating too damn much. And, right. and so they're just trying to deflect from their own responsibility for what they're doing. Exactly. I'm, I just finished a paper just yesterday called Personal Responsibility or Public Health, where I basically take the whole concept of personal responsibility apart. And bottom line is, the reason that we have this thing called personal responsibility is not because of the Declaration of Independence, not because of the Constitution, not because of any state legislature, not because of the Magna Carta, not because of any proclamation edict or anything else. It's because of the tobacco industry, because they were getting killed on the science of tobacco and lung cancer, and they had to invent another reason for you to smoke. Nobody put that uh, uh, cigarette in your mouth. Nobody lit it for you. Personal responsibility, right. you know? This is not America. This is actually corporations playing with your brain. And so yeah. we're not going to solve the food, metabolic health, and by the way, climate problem until we solve this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree. I, I understand. And you talk about the tobacco company playbook, deny, deflect, distract, delay. I still remember, I'm old enough to remember C. Everett Koop sitting there in front of Congress and saying what the tobacco industry didn't want him to say, which is, uh, you know, cigarettes can kill you. Mm -hmm. I would love to see it in my lifetime that uh, we see this sugar and processed food uh, kill you. Um, but let's let's move on to pharmaceuticals because of our time. And the medical industry. When I went in for my uh, high blood pressure to my doctor, he gave me two pills and it came down. My blood pressure was fine. Uh, diabetes, he was just about to give me some insulin until I found, you know, recovery. Uh, the pharma industry has a lot of power, just like the food industry. Yeah. It's a massive, massive industry. And so, and the medical profession is taught. They're not taught so much about nutrition as they are. You got a problem, let's treat the symptom and throw some pills at it. So but, talk about that. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm a product of that. You know, I went to medical school, graduated in 1980. You know, the only reason I'm sitting here talking to you today is because I majored in nutritional biochemistry in college. Okay? So I learned yeah. a lot of this stuff before I went to medical school. And then I went to medical school and they beat it out of me and told me none of it was important, none of it mattered. This is not how we take care of patients. And, you know, I was paying good money, you know, to learn how to be a doctor. And, you know, these are the gurus. And so, you know, I accepted what I learned. And then, of course, my patients didn't get better. They only got worse mm. over the course of yeah. the next 20 years. And so I started doing research in the field and came to the realization that everything that they had taught me about this back in college was right. And everything they taught me in medical school was wrong. So then the question is, why was that? And the only reason I could think of is because 80% of medical education is underwritten by big pharma because they yeah. want you to be in, you know, dealing with the two P's, prescriptions and procedures. That's what you learn in medical school. Mm -hmm. You don't learn any nutrition. Only 28% of medical schools even have a nutrition curriculum. And those that do have a total of 19.6 contact hours median. Now, considering there are 6,000 contact hours in a medical education, and considering that 80% of all of the healthcare problems in America could be solved by changing diet, that seems a little lopsided, right? And yes. no one's really teaching what's going on because they think nutrition is what they should be teaching. No, what they need to teach is metabolic health. Nutrition is only valuable as it informs metabolic health, but it's one step divorced from it. Right. So teaching yeah. nutrition is useless. Teaching metabolic health is valuable. Yeah. And then how nutrition can influence metabolic health is what the excitement is. But yes. medical schools don't know how to do it because it's never been part yeah. of the curriculum before. So we're actually trying right. to change that. And I'm actually helping to write a nutrition curriculum for a university here in the United States right now. 14 weeks, you know, one, uh, three hours a week, you know, to, uh, to, to bring this to practitioners. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Let's talk about food addiction. Um, 
dieting is hard. I did it for 43 years. I was really good at it. And then until I went back to the food for uh, the solution, I was addicted to it. You say exercise, you cannot outrun a bad diet. Right. Uh, and there is plenty of data out here that shows that sugar is addictive. It isn't a food. It is not essential for us to live. And big food knows it. Yep. Big pharma knows this. So talk about food addiction. So, the, you know, first of all, not everybody believes that there is this thing called food addiction. You know, we haven't been able to get it into the DSM-5 yet. Um, right. There are a whole bunch of people trying to fix that, including, of course, Esther and, you know, many other people. Uh, I yes. am trying to do my best as well. It has been a, a, a difficult slog. One of the reasons that people, you know, that, that the establishment has not glommed on to this yet is because not everybody gets addicted. That's true. You know, not everybody gets addicted to alcohol. Not everybody gets addicted yeah. to nicotine. Okay. Virtually everybody gets addicted to heroin. Virtually everybody gets addicted to cocaine. But, you know, there's obviously penetrance issues, you know, because not everybody gets addicted to uh, alcohol. The alcohol, I think, is the best example of, you know, the best analogy for uh, sugar. And the reason is because, after all, alcohol and sugar metabolize the same way. So it makes sense. So 40% of America are teetotalers, never touch the stuff. 40% are social drinkers, can pick up a drink and put it down. I'm in that group. 10% are binge drinkers and 10% are chronic alcoholics. Now, what distinguishes that 20% that have a problem from the 80% that don't, we still don't know. But no one would argue that we have 20% of our population with an alcohol problem. So just because something is imbibable <laughs> doesn't mean it's not addictive. Well, it turns out sugar and alcohol metabolize the same way, so it makes sense that they would actually, and stimulate the reward system the same way. And anything that stimulates the reward system in the extreme will cause addiction whether it's a okay. chemical or whether it's a behavior. So right. there are people who say there's no such thing as food addiction. What I say is actually they're right. What we have in, instead is not food addiction, but food additive addiction. Because the only okay. two things that are found in food that are actually addictive are sugar and caffeine. The other things are okay. not. So any of the foods yeah. that we think of as addictive have sugar and caffeine. So they are really not foods. They are food additives. Like I said, they are not foods. Right. And that leads me to my next question, which is you, and you touched on it. And that is that people eat more food than their bodies need uh, for different reasons than being hungry. Yes. Some are stress eaters. Some are emotional eaters. Yes. Some of them are because inter insulin is interfering with hunger or hormones, satisfaction hormones. Yes. Some people have a combination of those eating patterns and are addicted. I would throw myself into this category. They can't stop from starting and they can't stop eating once they start. Yes. Uh, so that you talked about the dopamine in the brain and the receptors. I have an addict brain. There are people that have addict brains. You give me something that I like, I'm going to do more, uh, eat more, drink more. So that's what I wondered about with yep. this. You know, How much is food addiction and how much is it if, pe if people are eating for stress or emotional, you remove the stress and emotional, will they, will they stop eating, go on a diet, and lose weight forever? That's a really good question, Susan. And I'm going to tell you right now, straight out, I don't know the answer to that one. Okay. I don't know the answer yeah. to that one. The question is, is there the ability to actually reverse the entire addictive process? Well, one thing I'm very sure of is you won't reverse the entire addictive process as long as there are still... Uh, um, uh, chemicals and or behaviors around that will maintain that process. Mm -hmm. So being able to bring things back down to normal is a big question. And, you know, why that is, is still open for scientific debate. Um, I mm -hmm. went to the American Psychiatric Association's um, yes. symposium on food addiction just uh, two months ago, where Esther was there as well. And we've yes. heard all about this. And, you know, this is still a uh, work in progress, to be sure. So I don't yeah. know the answer to that. What I can say, what I can say is that what you need to do is you need 
to recognize what you're addicted to, help yourself change your environment, and then be on the lookout for anything else that you know might come up. What we need is we need the codification of food addiction as a DSM-5 so that people can get insurance coverage for therapy, so yes. that they can get into a program and be able to afford a program so that they can actually beat the process. And that's, that's where I was going to go next uh, with you. Uh, I understand from Esther that 98% of the people at the APA that would make a decision on what goes into the DSM-5, 98% said, yes, food, it, I understand that may, may get this wrong, food is an addiction, it's a substance use disorder, mm -hmm. and would be treated like alcohol or drugs, and, would, and insurance would have to cover it then. That, well, that's the idea. And, you know, we're yeah. not there yet. Uh, you know, the, the next DSM-6 will be, you know, 2033. And, um, you know, we need something way before then. You know, way before to, that. To yeah. their credit, the WHO has an ICD-11 code that actually can, uh, you, you know, fit uh, food in within substance abuse disorder. So, uh, yeah. The WHO has it, but the DSM does not. And unfortunately, yeah. in America, we run off the DSM in terms of insurance coverage. Sure. Understood. Okay. Well, we got it all in. We got one last question for you. Um, there is a list of, in, uh, and it's page 373 on your book on Kindle, and you list all the changes that you say need to happen. Uh, and if you could, I don't want to list them all, but if you could summarize and I want to add this. I was surprised you didn't say that food should be added in the DSM-5 as one of the things. Well, I, I, I think that it should be. I mean, there's no question. I think yeah. that, that it should yeah. be. Uh, you know, I, I've worked on this. I actually think that the single most important thing and the thing that is, is stopping anything else from working is subsidies. I think this is okay. you know, the line in the sand. We have to fix this problem. Subsidies distort the market. There's no economist on the planet that believes in food subsidies because they distort the market. Let the market work. Okay. Well, we sub what, do, what do we subsidize? We subsidize all the things that are killing us. Corn, wheat, soy, soy sugar. Okay. Those are all problems for their own specific reasons. None, you know, not least of which is addiction. And the bottom line is what would happen to the price of food if we got rid of all the food subsidies? The answer is it wouldn't change except two items, corn and sugar. Those would go up and that yeah. would be good because then we would reduce effective availability, people would reduce consumption, and that would be good for society. And it wouldn't change yeah. the rest of the cost of food. So to me, that's where we start. But of course, mm -hmm. that requires Congress because that's in the farm bill. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. And I, I to, to address one more point, this is uh, big food, big pharma, the medical. It's pretty complicated. It's a big behemoth. But you talk about personal responsibility. I think once you know, you can't unknow this stuff. <laughs> so I do think that someone needs to have take, and I took personal responsibility and said, I don't want to live like that anymore. I don't want to die. Well, uh, right. Okay, so I think people need to take personal responsibility for their health too. I, I agree with that. But the question is, if you exercise personal responsibility, what are the companies supposed to be exercising? Corporate responsibility governed by a government, FDA, USDA, governing them and imposing fines when they don't. Wouldn't that be nice? Oh, yeah. We're going to get there, <laughs> Rob. <laughs> We're going to get there, Rob. And I would, I hope it's in our lifetimes. You're, you're pretty close. We're to doing our age, best. So. Yeah. Hey, it's been an honor and a privilege to read your book, get to know you, um, host you. And thank you for getting the truth out there without fear, with boldness. It's a great book, Metabolical. Everyone should read it. And uh, I'm going to put the link in our notes. So thanks for being a guest today. Thanks for having me, Susan. My pleasure. This is the Food Addiction Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the podcast and learned more about this disease. We hope you will rate and write a review on this podcast and share it with others. If you or someone you know is suffering from the disease of food addiction, there is a solution. 
The various food addiction recovery programs are available and listed on the website, theinfactschool.com. Or if you would like to know more about how to get certified in treating food addiction, the school is accepting applications now for its next training beginning in September 2023. Go to theinfactschool.com. That's I-N-F-A-C-T school.com to learn more. Are you passionate about helping others overcome food addiction? Do you dream of making a real difference in people's lives? Look no further than the Infact School, the first and only program that offers an accredited international professional certification for food addiction professionals. With over 170 hours of engaging and informative online virtual teaching sessions, you'll delve deep into the world of food addiction and gain the knowledge and skills needed to make a lasting impact. Our experienced instructors who are leading experts in the field will guide you through the latest research and evidence-based practices. The Infact School goes beyond theory and equips you with the hands-on skills you need to support individuals on their journey to recovery. You'll gain invaluable experience working directly with clients under the supervision of our faculty. Upon completion of our program, you'll be a certified food addiction professional, ready to make a positive impact in the lives of those struggling with food addiction. Join the Infact School today and be a part of the solution. Together, let's conquer food addiction and build a healthier future for all. Visit our website at www.infactschool.com to learn more and enroll in our professional training program. The journey starts here at the Infact School.